our first CNW research uh, lunch and learn of 2024, the calendar year. Um, we are really excited today to um, have Dr. Don MacArthur and Dr. Rosie Toomey um, uh, join us from the BCCHR Research Technology and Development Office. Uh, we're gonna talk about writing effective letters of support and collaboration. Uh, really the hope is that if any of you folks are kind of gearing up towards the upcoming project grant competition, that this can hopefully um, provide some help um, for you um, along that path. Um, I apologize for the feedback um, uh, that for my audio. Um, before we jump in and I pass the mic over to our presenters today, um, I do want to acknowledge um, that we are, um, uh, or I am rather, um, an, an uninvited guest on the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, and my role as the Knowledge Translation Manager at the WHRI um, you know, as, as a representative of that organization, I do want to acknowledge um, that we have a commitment to improving the health outcomes of women, um, including folks who are non-binary and gender diverse. And we do recognize our own role um, and collective efforts towards establishing culturally safe healthcare systems and services um, that address health inequities among Indigenous peoples, especially Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit peoples. Um, and something we like to do is to just um, encourage folks to um, uh, read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada calls to action and the In Plain Sight report to um, yeah, just be a part of um, your ongoing learning and unlearning journey. Apologies, I have two tiny humans with me today. Okay, with that, I will um, pass the mic. Thank you. Um, I will pass the mic. I will, I will pass the mic over to uh, Dawn and Rosie. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Nicole. Rosie, Thanks. Rosie is the leader of this Lunch and Learn. Um, and I am the backup in case her technology, because she lives on a mountain, fails. So um, I would Thanks, like Ma. to, yeah, Rosie, I would like to introduce Rosie uh, to me, Dr. Rosie to me, who joined the Research and Technology Development Office in November. Um, as our new uh, WHRI BCCHR Bridge uh, Research Development Facilitator. Rosie comes to us with lots and lots of experience in various types of research and also worked for one of the CHR institutes for a year or so as Associate Director, and we're very excited that she's here. Thank you. Oh, there we are, and I'm, I'm appearing oh, on video that. as well. There we go. Hi everyone, um, very nice to be here. Welcome, and I'm so pleased my video has just started working. Perfect timing. Um, I also want to begin by echoing um, Nicole's acknowledgement. So for myself as a settler from England, I'm extremely grateful to live and work on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples. Um, and actually, I usually try to share a resource during that land acknowledgement. So um, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, I tried to share a resource for my own kind of learning about Indigenous cultural safety. And in this case, I'd like to share a paper associated with the BC Children's and Women's Community, which I came across this week. Um, and so this research paper, it was guided by Indigenous elders and elders in training, Indigenous and non-Indigenous academics and community members. And this paper, the topic is on culturally sensitive um, patient reported outcome measures, which is relevant to many of pe people in this uh, research community. So I'd like to recommend this as a, as a recent example of honoring indigenous experiences within the context of a study. So if you haven't had a chance to read it yet, um, I do highly recommend it. Next slide. For those of you um, who are perhaps less familiar, the goal of the RTDO is to maximize the success of researchers, both at BC Children's Hospital Research Institute and the Women's Health Research Institute to obtain external funding. So our team helps with um, research development broadly, that includes strategic planning, grant proposal and development and review. Um, and so for those of you joining who I have not had a chance to meet over the past couple of months since I've been with BCCHR and WHRI, 
I'm also really happy to introduce myself as the primary grants facilitator for WHRI members. And I'll pass to Dawn here, um, who might like to say a little bit more about the RTDO. Thanks, Rosie. So RTDO was established in 2003. I was recruited to our campus many years ago. So that means we just celebrated our 20th anniversary. Uh, we work on with the research community to help develop ideas, plans, programs, grants, any size, uh, infrastructure grants, team grants, network grants, salary awards. And some of you may have worked with Tamra English, uh, the senior research facil research development facilitating the office on scholarships and fellowships. Uh, we prefer to begin with the research ideas and move through looking for funding and getting funding. And that includes all aspects of research including implementation science, KT, a whole variety of different things. So uh, reach out. And um, Rosie will, has the contact information on one of the later slides. And um, the other thing I just wanted to say here is that today's Lunch and Learn is supported by the research and uh, both by WHRI through um, Nicole and also Ashley Biggerstaff and the research education program. And so there's a bunch of us on here. And the topic Thanks. is a really important one. Thanks. Um, next slide, please. So this session is focused on letters of support and collaboration. And these are letters that are submitted as part of a funding application. So there are some objectives that I'll talk us through today. So um, firstly, it's for you to become familiar with recent updates to CIHR project grant instructions, which specifically relate to these letters of um, collaboration and support. Also so that you can describe the style and content of effective letters and understand best practices for engaging with partners on these letters and also requesting letters. So I'm gonna talk through these topics for the next 25 minutes or so, I think, and then I'll pass to Dawn, who's going to talk through some specific examples, and I'm sure add lots of insight based on her many years of experience. Next slide. So different funders will have different requirements for letters that contribute to your grant application. And I know this week, the RTDO team and maybe some of the audience are focused on Michael Smith Health Research BC Scholar applications and health professional investigator applications. And those programs come with their own specific guidance for letters of collaboration. But to be clear, I'm going to be specifically talking about the CIHR project grants. And I don't like to a, assume any knowledge. So if there are trainees or perhaps international trainees in the audience who are unfamiliar with this, um, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research is the federal agency responsible for funding health research in Canada. The project grant application uh, program within this is a flagship CIHR funding competition. So it's designed to fund the best ideas with the highest potential to improve health, healthcare, or health systems. The program itself runs twice per year in the spring and the fall. And um, less than 20% of new applications to this competition are funded, though that does increase with RTDO support. But the point is to mention that this is a very competitive competition and researchers spend a lot of time preparing these applications. And the letters of support and collaboration are one important part of that. So the upcoming spring 2024 project grant deadline is approaching. The registration is in February um, and the full application deadline is March 6th. So this is when those letters would be required to be submitted. And some of you will have already seen that there have been some updates to the application process starting with this spring 2024 competition. So I'm going to take the opportunity to talk through the big one, which relates to today's topic. So this main update is that CIHR is limiting the types of additional materials that can be uploaded with your application. So the research proposal, the 10 page research proposal should now contain a complete description of the project with all of the information that's required for reviewers to assess the project um, and the research plan with no hyperlinks. And 
this means that there are um, you are no longer allowed to uh, submit supplementary documents like tables, figures, um, questionnaires, surveys, participant consent forms, um, and publications related to the research plan. So that does um, change things quite significantly for people who have been submitting project grants for some time. Um, there are limited mandatory attachments. So one of those is the certificate of completion of completing the um, sex and gender based analysis training modules. Um, and the other one is related to these letters that you can submit. So there are two types of letters that can be submitted. There are specific letters of support that are mandatory, and then there are letters of collaboration, which are optional. And so I'm going to differentiate between these two. Next slide, please. So there are three situations where letters of support are mandatory and each of these should be relatively easy for you to think yes or no, I need to include that. Um, so the first one is for nominated principal applicants who have a pending appointment. In that case, um, a letter of support from the Dean of the Faculty um, confirming the date that your appointment will start is, is needed. And so this is mainly relevant to new faculty who have accepted a job offer, but not yet started in their appointment. So you can see it's quite a specific scenario. And this letter is just providing confirmation that the of the research's start date and the eligibility to, to hold funding. So the appointment must begin before the funding start date. The next one is another very specific scenario. So if somebody on the application is an international researcher and that international researcher is going to be paid from the grant, then they will need to provide you with a letter from their employer to confirm that they're not going to be paid twice, basically. So they can't be paid from both the grant and the employer for grant funded activities. Both of those examples are quite administrative, um, not especially interesting. So let's move on to the ones that get a little bit more interesting. So the third and final mandatory letter of support is um, needed for proposals related to indigenous health research. In this case, it's mandatory to have letters of community support from indigenous par partners. This is super important and um, it has some specific considerations. So I'm actually gonna pause here and come back to this specific topic in a few slides time. So those are the three mandatory, pending appointment, international researcher and um, indigenous health research. The one type of optional letter that can be submitted alongside your application is the um, these letters of collaboration. So these are to the nominated principal applicant and they outline a specific service to be provided and think of that word service quite broadly. So the examples that they give here are access to equipment, um, provision of specific space or equipment, um, sorry, reagents or um, access to space, access to patient populations would be included here. Um, you can think quite broadly about knowledge translation and what that might involve and having letters from knowledge users in that case. Something that was not included in the original announcement about these changes to the process is that reviewers must now read all of the application materials that are provided. And this includes optional letters of collaboration. This was not previously mandatory. So to, to put this another way, the letters of collaboration might be optional for you as an applicant to um, submit, but once they're submitted, they're not optional for the reviewers to read. The reviewers will consult them. So for that reason, we do recommend that um, if you have an institution or a community organization, patient advisory board uh, or knowledge user who's going to provide a specific service, you absolutely should include a letter of collaboration, it's worth including. Um, next slide, please. Focusing on these letters of collaboration, who might provide 
these letters. So I've mentioned a few examples. And firstly, these could be what CIHR defines as applicant partners. These are typically organizations that you as an applicant has ide have identified and they contribute funding or in-kind resources to the projects. Um, and also it could be collaborators and CIHR counts these as individuals who provide a specific service within the project. I'm going to use partners and collaborators interchangeably today um, because for our purposes that they're, they're the same for a letter of collaboration. Um, also, I mentioned knowledge users, uh, particularly relevant for any knowledge translation elements. And this could include patient groups, healthcare administrators, uh, decision makers of any kind, community leaders. Um, and so, yes, those are also people that would be providing a specific service. They might be providing assistance with um, some type of knowledge, knowledge dissemination activity. The purpose of these letters of these optional letters of collaboration, firstly, they're going to provide um, detailed information about the partnership and lend credibility to um, your partnership. So establish exists and it's meaningful. They're also um, there to confirm the monetary support if that if that's applicable or the in-kind support with details about that support and also demonstrate the commitment to the applicant and to the research project itself. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about style and content here. And if you're uncertain if letters are addressed to the applicant or CIHR or the peer review committee, they are addressed to the non nominated principal applicant. CIHR now uses the wording to the MPA, nominated principal applicant. So that answers that question. Um, they do need to be original, current, and tailored to the research project and the applicant. So of course, letter templates can be really helpful, but they should be considered a starting point. Um, just like if you were submitting a cover letter for a job application, you would tailor that cover letter to the job application. And that's the same thing here. You're tailoring the letter of collaboration where your partner is to you and your specific research project. They can open with a um, statement of the intent or purpose of the letter. So this could be Dear Dr. MacArthur, I'm writing in support of your CIHR project grant application entitled X. They need to be explicit and specific about the support that will be provided. And I'm going to give some more details on this over the next few slides. Well-organized and succinct. So CIHR does have a page limit of five pages per letter. Um, but it's unlikely that you're going to need to use those five pages. You do have plenty of room. And um, there's variation because of formatting differences, but typically these letters tend to be one to two pages long and they can still include all of the relevant details at that length. And then um, they can close with a statement of enthusiasm and excitement and strong support for your, for your application. Next slide, thank you. So a little bit about the content over the next four slides. Um, and most of the information from this point is relevant to nearly all funding opportunities. So this is where it's relevant beyond the CIHR project grants. First of all, um, starting with background information. Um, this is going to depend on the type of partnership. There's no one size fits all approach here because each situation is unique and each partnership is unique. unique. But some examples about what this background information needs to or potentially needs to include. So for individual collaborators, this could be details about their background or their experience or their professional credentials. Um, for an organization, uh, details about the person who's writing the letter, because if you're if they're representing uh, an organization and signing the letter on behalf of that organization, then they could outline their role. So that might be executive director, it might be chair of a board, for example. 
also for an organization um, background information about the organization itself. So this can typically be found on the organization's web page, um, but your organization may wish to kind of write this section themselves, or they may wish you to, to um, pull from their web page. The uh, partner's relationship to the research project and relationship to the applicant. So this could include any previous collaborations, that you have any work, any work that you've already done together um, and the status of the current partnership and how you're working together. One thing you want to try to demonstrate in the background is the partner's familiarity with your work and the goals of uh, the research itself. And this is part of that tailoring the uh, letter of collaboration. Um, if it's a new collaboration, it could also be relevant to include background information on if the partner has previously been involved in any similar projects or similar knowledge translation activities. Next slide, please. Okay, so relevance. So the relevance typically covers two areas, timeliness and alignment, I would say. So with Timeliness, this is um, about why it makes sense to do this project now. How is this project timely and how does it address a need or gap currently as relevant and from the perspective of the partner? So you as an applicant also speak to this within your research proposal, but your partner's perspective can strengthen this. And then with alignment, this is about how the project is applicable and meaningful and worthwhile to the partner. So how is it related to their priorities, if it's potentially a patient partner, or in the case of an organization, how does it align with their vision or mandate? And this also links with how the partner will look to use the results. And this crosses both relevance and impact, which we'll come on to. So um, next slide, please. For impact, can your partner speak to the changes that could be made in the real world as a direct or indirect result of your research? So this could be changes in health outcomes, practice, policy, another societal or economic impact, catalyzing future research um, or specific uh, benefits to, to the um, partner. <coughs> Excuse me. And this really helps to emphasize um, the potential impact of your project if your partner also validates that that knowledge will be useful to them outside of your specific research team. Depending on the circumstances and the partnership, they could include quite specific details on how they are going to use the results or much more general details about how the um, research will contribute to future research and knowledge. So you can see that your partner is going to meet, need to be quite familiar with your research plan. Um, and depending on their background, they may well need your support with drafting the letter. Next slide, please. Finally, um, you need to outline these specific and explicit details about the support that's going to be provided. Uh, if there's monetary support, the specific amount, the duration, and the purpose of that funding can be stated. Um, for in-kind services, this could include many different things. So a couple of examples, it could be the in-kind time of staff or students, any access to space or equipment for the project, um, mechanisms to facilitate knowledge translation that the partner is going to facilitate or lead any specific tasks that they're going to complete. So that might be statistical analysis, um, activities. For patient partners, it might be um, their willingness to share relevant lived experiences with the researchers, um, noting that they do not need to disclose any details within the letter of collaboration that they don't, that they don't wish to disclose. And then any other details about this type of support and, and moving the research into practice as relevant. Um, next slide, please. So as a trainee or researcher um, who has experience with grant applications, if you receive a request to write a letter of um, collaboration for a colleague's application, 
it would be relatively easy for you to to do this and to follow the the style and content that I've talked about. For partners, this might actually seem like quite a lot to get right. And um, I've worked with patient partners within research projects and within CIHR Institute level patient engagement research ambassadors. And a continuous frustration is not receiving enough mentorship or support from researchers on applicant profile CVs and letters of collaboration. So though there's no one, one size fits all approach for how to request that letter or whether you draft that letter, um, the process itself does need to be collaborative, especially for people with lived experience. And whenever you're working with non-academic partners, that, and, and even some cases with academic partners, the onus is on you to facilitate this process in a way that works for them. Next slide. So for that reason, I'm going to take a step back here and talk about partnership principles. And these are the spore patient engagement principles which extend throughout the research process, but they're also relevant to consider with all partners before you get to the stage of requesting or drafting a letter of collaboration. So firstly, thinking about inclusiveness. In this context um, with letters, it means creating an environment where your partners can meaningfully participate in your grant development and research development. Um, so what barriers might there be for your partner and how can you look to reduce those barriers so they can participate? And by including them early in the process, it means that they can get to a stage where they feel confident to, to either edit, edit a letter that you've drafted or sign, sign a letter by the time you get to the stage of the letters of collaboration, you're including them upfront. Support can mean providing adequate flexibility and um, other types of support so that they can contribute. So it might be one-on-one -on -one meetings to explain the research or application process. And then flexibility means allowing sufficient time for them to complete the requests, whether that's an executive director who's you know, extremely busy with multiple different um, things or, or a person living with a chronic condition where they're dealing with episodic symptoms. For patient partners, this also could involve financial compensation for their involvement. Um, and if you don't have funding for that yet, then you can include it in the grant that you're working on because that's increasingly expected at CIHR. Mutual respect, uh, different types of expertise and experience are recognized and valued and you facilitate communication that's regular and open and honest. So it might be appropriate for you to draft a letter, but make it clear that you respect their input too, and that you're going to ask them what they prefer. And co-building, so ideally, as I mentioned, research and researchers and their partners work together early so that partners can share in that decision-making process, um, contribute to the research plan and explain their priorities before you get to the point of requesting a letter of collaboration. Next slide, please. So not a, um, a one-size-fits-all approach doesn't work for everybody. So in the case of your first research collaboration with a patient partner, um, those are some of the things I mentioned that you might be considering. And you might approach this in a way um, such as um, sending them an email initially to say, well, after, you know, after you've built this partnership, to say the funder has quite specific expectations for letters of collaboration. Is it gonna be okay with you if I draft the letter for you to edit? We can then meet to discuss any questions that you have. So you're comfortable signing this before the deadline in March. Like that's an example way to approach that request. Um, <clears throat> for a long-term partnership with say a nonprofit health organization who have previously provided many letters of collaboration for your funding applications, the important part here is that all letters must be current and unique. So you cannot just use a previous letter that's been provided um, previously. It does need to be updated. Uh, the date needs to be updated. The, the letter side, signer needs to agree again to sign that letter. Don't make assumptions about their um, willingness to also provide the letter of collaboration the next time around and make sure it's original and um, current. 
and then a BCCHR or WHRI service. So maybe this is a statistician or KT consultant. You really want to make sure you're involving these people as early as possible as well. So for example, um, a statistician should not be receiving a request for a letter of collaboration a few weeks ahead of the deadline when they haven't given their input on the statistical analysis that's included within your grant proposal yet. So it's just to mention that there are different situations. Each one's going to be unique. Every time you have each year you submit an application, there's going to be a negotiation with your um, with your partner. Another thing to mention on example two, this long-term partnership with an organization, sometimes you're dealing with a contact within that organization rather than the person who's going to be signing the letter. So this is another example where you do need to give enough time so that the contact that you're working with has time to communicate with their executive director, say, if that's the person that's signing the letter. Um, so time and um, not a one size fits all approach. Next slide, please. OK, so I paused on this topic earlier. And so coming back to it now, um, these are the mandatory Indigenous letters or community support for those involved in Indigenous health research in keeping with Indigenous values and traditions. And I know there's some of this research community who are involved in partnerships with Indigenous peoples, organisations and communities. And I think everyone will be aware that there's very specific guidance for respectful communication and engagement um, before you get to the stage of working together on a letter of community of support. So time here is going to be needed to build meaningful and reciprocal relationships. So it, I'm not going to go into the specific content because that's going to look different for each one of these partnerships. And the, the, the work that happens before that point is the important part. There are um, specific guidance and training and services that you can reach out to. So if you're in the process of building an Indigenous health research project, engage with those dedicated services. And that will depend on your affiliation. So there's the Indigenous Research Support Initiative at UBC or um, SFU has the Indigenous Research Institute. And, and there are other um, examples of kind of guidance on um, developing those respectful relationships and working with elders effectively. So um, you can also link with uh, Nicole at WHRI on KT generally, and also Oakley uh, is the EDI manager at BCCHR and linking them, linking and connecting with them would be great too. I guess the important thing is that requesting a letter of collaboration um, from an indigenous community is absolutely not something to add on to an existing project a few weeks ahead of the deadline. This is going to take time as I'm sure that you'll appreciate. Although it does take time and training and learning and unlearning, um, I did wanna mention something in case you are considering a project grant with a central focus on indigenous health research, even now or in the future, further down the line with your research program. Um, applications, for the project grant with a central focus on Indigenous health research, if they're assigned to the Indigenous Health Peer Review Committee, they actually might undergo iterative review. And um, this means that applicants have the opportunity to make an excellent application outstanding and to strengthen that application. So basically the peer reviewers will take a mentorship approach. And it's just something I wanted to mention because I don't think it's um, common knowledge necessarily, but it's something to take the opportunity to be involved in if you can, if you are working on um, towards in these building meaningful relationships with indigenous communities. Okay, next slide, please. And I'm just finishing up here. Can I just add one quick thing to the yes. indigenous thing? One of the things that we get asked quite a lot uh, is for if is if we can share examples of letters, other types of letters. Now I'm going to show some examples after at the very end of this. The one type of letter that we will never share is a letter of support from an indigenous partner community because the confidentiality and the individuality of those letters is um very important and uniquely important. So we will never share those. The information about those letters comes from the Indigenous community itself and is part of their knowledge. They own those. Thanks. Um, 
Thanks. Thanks, Anne. Yes, next slide. Great. So um, in general, just coming back to WHRI and BCCHR requests, um, whether that's requests for Nicole's support with KT or working with the RTDO, our slogan is the earlier, the better. As early as possible, connect with the RTDO team and um, relevant research services, because although we will do everything possible to support you a few weeks ahead of the deadline, and we, and we often do that, we can often save you time and really look for ways to um, strengthen your project grant applications when you connect with us earlier. And it's just it's it's super helpful when thinking about letters of support and collaboration as well. Um, for WHRI members, uh, please reach out to me if you're developing a project grant or another application or drop a note into the chat maybe and I can follow up with you later. I've had the chance to meet some of you, but it'd be great to um, connect with more of you in the next few weeks. On the topic of project grants, uh, in general, allowing enough time for any of the documents that are associated with project grants. So this includes the UBC research project information forms. So make sure you're aware of the guidelines for um, getting those in for signatures uh, well ahead of the deadline, just to make sure that there are no hiccups along the way. And then last slide from me, please, Nicole. So here are some resources that I used within these slides, and I can also I can drop them into the chat as Dawn is going through some examples. Um, of course, you can reach out to the RTDO team, um, and just to mention that also alongside me and Dawn, that also includes Dr. Tamara English and Rita Jacobsons. And I will stop there and pass over to Dawn, who is going to show some specific letters from previous years, and um, I'm sure share some insights from her many years of experience. Thanks, Rosie. Um, so I'm just going to share three examples. That's a funny new one. Hand claps are flying across my screen. That's kind of a new one. Anyway, just going to show a couple of examples. Um, so in this example, I've got too many things on my screen. I can't change this to, I can't see my navigation. Okay, there we go. I think Don, even if you want to zoom in um, to, yeah. the, to that slide, it would be totally fine. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry. I, I had too many things on my screen. I couldn't see the thing. So sorry. It's a little bit blurry. So this is a letter. This is an example of a letter from another researcher. So it's a letter of collaboration, the kind of thing. So it, it's addressed to a particular individual and it says, dear doctor, so-and-so, I am of this parent grant. So this, in this particular case, it's an NIH oversight clinical trial that's being done. And the grant that's being applied for is an ancillary studies grant about biomarkers in this particular case. And so this is a letter from the principal investigator of the main study. And so it talks about what the parent grant, it talks about who the person is, what the parent grant is about. So the parent study, so that would go with the background part that Rosie talked about. And then it talks about the logistics. And what I've highlighted here is what they will actually do. They're gonna provide 25 mils of blood for this, blah, blah, blah. They will have data going in and they will have actual access to the data and why it's important. So the impact is on the biomarker studies um, are a key part of the bigger picture and they're eager to participate. So it's short. It's not a literature review of the big background on why the parent study was. It's just, here's the parent study. This is what it's about. Here's its scope. And this is exactly the type of ancillary study and collaboration I'd hoped I could result from my study. I didn't highlight that, but that's impact and importance right there. And then the specifics of what they're going to do. The next one is a collab is a letter from an um, external partnering organization. In this case, the Society of Obstetrics and Gynecologists of Canada, which uh, I pulled because it's quite relevant to this audience. So it was to a particular person about a particular project, and it was, they were very happy. The SOGC would do this for this particular grant with the title, what's the mandate of this SOGC? 
and how the grant is associated with how it brings in SOGC members, and then it acknowledges as the designated working group the development of a particular guideline and policy currently being working through, and the SOG contribute a certain amount of money. I redacted the amount of money. In-kind contribution for a particular thing. And this would be the first guideline, so that's important. Now, the person who signed this was a, a C, an executive, like the leader of the SOGC, even though in the situation of this letter, the uh, principal applicant was talking to somebody um, in the who wasn't the actual uh I don't remember what the the president of the SOGC it was a vice president or a senior administrator and so in this situation this kind of letter can get drafted by the principal by the researcher and or with the administrator and then can go for vetting and revision to the person who's going to sign it and then the person's going to sign it but again this is a letter from you know our national uh organization about what they're going to do. I also pulled letters from successful grants, just so you know, um, so that this particular aspect of what they're gonna do is very, very short and sweet, very succinct. And here's a letter from the, well, if you got, so BC Children's, BC Children's Hospital Research Institute was for quite a, about a decade called the Child and Family Research Institute. So here's the thing about a workshop application where so example of a CIHR planning and dissemination grant or a Michael Smith reach type grant um, where, so it talks about, you know, this actually was a maternity care KT workshop. So that's quite a long time ago. And they're going to contribute $5,000 toward the direct cost and including to contributing space for the meeting and facilitation by our RTDO office, Sis, you know, signature. Very short and sweet. Less than a letter, lot, sorry, less than a page because it's very explicit about what it's going to show. So these three examples are all on one page. I actually changed the margins of this one to bring it onto one page because it had like really big margins, but um, just for this presentation. So this was just on to the second page. So even though you might get five pages maximum, the odds of needing to use five pages are very, very slim. So I just wanted to show a couple of examples of how explicit letters should be. This is who, you know, this is who we're addressing. This is who we are. This is why this activity or this partnership or this collaboration is important. If we're contributing something as a partner, this is what we're doing. And thanks very much. We're excited about it. Bam. Okay. Um, there are some situations, for example, Indigenous community partnerships, which will be more um, probably more detailed than the three examples I've given here. Um, but, uh, and sometimes the, if you're doing a research collaboration, sometimes the activities are, are more explicit too, but keeping it short and simple, reviewers are reading a lot of things. They want to be able to get to the point. And also I think in, in a, if you're doing a project grant, one of the things that's really important in your project grant in a feasibility section is to say what your partnerships are and summarize what the letters say. Don't make a reviewer go to the letters, figure out all the details and individual contributions of all the letters and put and integrate it in their own head. That's quite a lot of cognitive load for a reviewer. We want to summarize it. And then the letters are the supporting documentation for what's in the proposal itself. Thank you. Q&A. So Rosie, can you see the chat now? I can, yes. Okay. So we have a uh, question. When you're doing the Q&A, can you make up sure you read out the questions that are in the chat too, just for the recording? Yeah. So we have a question from Mindgold. If my collaborator is also one of my references, but they can only provide a letter of collaboration or a reference letter, for example, from MS Foundation Fellowship, how should we decide the letter they should provide? Um, I think we can both answer this, but my first ref thing is I would absolutely 100% make it the reference letter. Um, especially if 
it's your um, if it's a really key aspect of the research program, because they can talk about collaboration in a reference letter, but they can't talk about being your reference in a collaboration letter. So that would be my answer. Rosie's nodding. Yeah, but... fully agree. Uh, while we wait for extra questions to come in um, to the Q&A um, part, I'm just wondering, Don and Rosie, if I can sneak in a quick question about going back to Rosie, your, your um, example of organizations. Um, you know, we've had the case where sometimes the, the leaders of organizations change and the commitments being made to um, the project itself can kind of be questioned, right? So so is there a way to kind of account for leadership changes and sustainability of that partnership in, in the letter of support or collaboration? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And it's a tricky one. And, and you're right, the leadership can often change. And I think that part of it is having more than one contact within the organization. So make sure you're building that, that relationship with the organization and more than just your, your single contact um, within, within that organization. But within the, um, within the letter of support collaboration, I'm not sure, Dawn, have you seen someone try to account for that previously? I mean, you're talking about the duration of that support and that duration needs to, needs to remain the same regardless of changes in leadership. So yeah. Um, so to me, uh, two things cross my mind. One is if you know that there's been a change in leadership. So like a lot of professional organizations will have a new president slash CEO person every three years, or sometimes the term is five years. Sometimes it's two. Um, sometimes if it is your own professional organization, you know, the leadership has changed. So you want to reach out as soon as leadership changes Well, not immediately give them a minute to breathe. But to say, you know, that um, you're looking forward to ongoing, you know, the ongoing interaction and relationship. Um, the other thing that happens in that context is that is often in parallel with a leadership change is a new strategic plan. And so you really should inform yourself about the partner, if it's an organization, um, whether it's a not-for-profit, a government, an industry, it doesn't really matter who it is, um, that you're aware of their strategic plan so that you can actually show how you align with their strategic plan and you will help them achieve their objectives. The second thing in the explicit, so that's about you as a researcher, um, you know, maintaining those relationships and and um and the ongoing things because don't rely on an organization to make you their priority you have to make the organization your priority um and that goes for any kind of collaboration patient partnership community partnership it doesn't matter the onus is on you as the researcher to keep those things moving forward and keeping them alive um the only thing that i the other thing that i would suggest is that the letter even if at any time, the specific details in the letter. So rather than, the example that crossed my mind is rather than saying, we will commit you know, $10,000 to this initiative, you might get, we will commit $10,000 in year 2024 to this initiative, or we will, you know, we will give $2,000 of income support per year for the next five years, 2004 to 2009. Like be as explicit and, and clear as possible in the letter, because then they will see it. I mean, they will recognize it as a commitment and you'll be able to say, you know, this activity relies on this. And that can happen even if you have letters of, and uh, this is a bit dicey but even if you have a change in departmental leadership so it's just being vague means that there's room to for somebody to say I've already made that commitment um, or I've already achieved I've already fulfilled that commitment but if you're really explicit and um, I think when you do something like a CHR project grant because you have a annual budget that you have to put in it is pretty easy to be able to say it's you know two thousand or ten thousand dollars a year for three years or something like that and give the actual calendar years um 
one of the things that sometimes happens when you try to get that explicit with some types of, pay, of partners, community organizations, is that they don't, they feel like that's too much of a commitment that feels like a contract. And so one of the things that is important in those types of relationships is for them to recognize that A, you don't know if the grant will get funded or not, and B, that if something changes in their situation, whether the you know, time, money, space, whatever it is that they're doing, that of course that is flexible. That this isn't this isn't banking, you know, it's research and it is a give and take situation. So something could change for you where you can't fulfill your commitment to them. And just as easily something can um, change in their situation, meaning that the you have to reassess that commitment. Um, the letters, the whole point of the letter is just to show the support and commitment to the project by those collaborators, partners, and organizations. Thanks, Don. I appreciate you walking us through that. And yeah, just um, on the KT, I think this go kind of goes back to that partnership slide, Rosie, that you were talking about early engagement as early as humanly possible and being detailed in those commitments as the organization or partner feels comfortable. Yeah. Um, and, and, and when you have a new partnership, just like any new relationship, respect is really important. Okay. Don't try and push them to your crisis because they're not going to like that. And I mean, we don't like that. Research services doesn't like that. Uh, nobody likes that. So um, if you, you know, uh, signatures and things like that go through research services. And so um, they will, of course, try and accommodate you if there's a crisis. But if there's not a crisis, follow the timeline that they request. Earlier is better. Um, and where our office is concerned, because we don't really do deadlines per se, because we are collaborators with you on your stuff. But again, we have lives. And also, there's no, we can't help as much on things if things come to us late. We can help more when things come early. Thank you. Um, so we are three minutes to the hour. Um, does anyone have any remaining burning questions or shall we give you back the gift of time? Um, and thank you, Rosie and Dawn. This has been incredible, um, very practical. And also I think a good reminder as we all step into partnership engagement as well, because that's so critical to producing these documents. Thanks everybody for joining today and please do reach out if you have any, if any questions come up after, after this session. Thanks so much. Yeah. I think we all learned, we all learned something. We do this all the time, but forever learning and improving. Um, and for those folks, um, so thank you both so much. Yay. I'll, I'll do an actual clap Don, and not use my emoji. Um, well, so just, that I don't I disrupt your screen. screen before. <laughs> That's a new zoom thing. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it can be very distracting. Um, and for next month, um, really excited uh, to be able to share the Beyond the Binary Guide with um, the CNW research community. Um, so yeah, we'll see you next month and stay safe out there, everyone. Um, I hope you all have snow tires or vehicles or transportation that's safe. Um, and we'll see you next month. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Rosie. Awesome presentation, Rosie. Yes.